Okay, so as we all know, the, the population is growing and with this energy demands are also growing. And by uh, 2050, uh, our energy demands will be essentially doubled with respect to what we have nowadays. And of course, as we all know, this is uh, accompanied by also giant CO2 emissions, which is not good at all for our uh, climate. Yeah, this is uh, just to remind that uh, CO2 emissions lead to uh, global warming. And this is uh, nowadays becomes uh, even critical. So we uh, urgently need to do something, to at least to reduce or in a better stop at all CO2 emissions. And moreover, we all know that there are some geopolitical uh, issues nowadays. So we have, it's not easy to, to get uh, traditional sources of energy supplied to, to countries uh, across uh, the world. So it's a very nice alternative to this, uh, to switch to renewable energy sources, such as wind, solar, hydro, geothermal. This is uh, what we are, we are aiming at, at green energy. But if we take example, uh, Germany, uh, so on the left uh, hand side of this slide, you can see uh, wind, so the energy produced from wind and from sun. So this is, uh, of course, changing uh, throughout the year. And uh, if we want to rely on these energy sources, we need batteries to store this uh, energy and then use it when we need it. So all boils down to having um, good batteries. And uh, governments uh, worldwide uh, understood and realized that this is a big issue and we urgently need to act now. And just to give you a few examples, in, in Switzerland, we have so-called energy strategy 2050, where by 2050, we want to uh, reduce the CO2 emissions uh, actually to zero. Uh, then there is also the European Green Deal a Battery 2030 project. There are other uh, also uh, strategies in United States, China, and all other countries. So energy storage is needed at all scales, starting from portable electronics and uh, ending by electricity grids. And as Gerbrand Sider likes to say, the world is going electric. So this means that research and battery technology is really crucial especially nowadays. Uh, I think there is no need, but just to put us on, on the same uh, ground, uh, this is just to remind how lithium ion batteries uh, function. So we have a positive electrode, which is called cathode, negative electrode called anode, and then we, we have in the middle uh, liquid or, or solid state electrolyte. So in my talk, I, I'm gonna focus only on uh, cathodes. And finally, so this is just some uh, list of challenges in the battery technology. So as we know, there is no any single material that satisfies simultaneously all properties of a good battery, such as low cost and eco-friendliness, sustainability, non-toxicity, high power density and high energy density, good cyclability, good thermal stability, etc. So there is an urgent need to discover and design novel materials for efficient rechargeable batteries that can help us to meet the needs of ever increasing population, uh, population in the climate neutral way. And first principle simulations can be really helpful uh, in this respect. And I will try to show in the rest of my talk what can be done uh, nowadays with uh, using computational tools. So let me uh, switch to theory and codes that we're using. Uh, I think many of you have heard about density functional theory. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but just uh, uh, summarize in a nutshell. So the main idea in DFT is to go from the uh, many body wave function, which is the uh, function of three N variables, where N is the number of particles. We use instead the charge density, which is simply a function of three variables. So essentially, we are simplifying the problem that we need to solve enormously. And uh, thanks to DFT, we can really solve many problems for realistic materials. Uh, in practice, uh, in DFT, we replace the interacting system by some auxiliary system where particles actually do not interact. So if in real world, uh, electrons are moving in some external potential, 
created by ions. Uh, we're actually replacing this problem by uh, auxiliary problem where uh, electrons are moving in some effective potential. But the point is that the density of the real system and our uh, fictitious system is exactly the same. So this allows us to make draw some useful conclusions. All many body quantum effects are incorporated in the so-called exchange correlation energy functional. Uh, however, in practice, we don't know the exact expression of this exchange correlation functional. And so what we do, we use some approximations. However, these approximations, they have some side effect and on physical effects such as so-called self-interaction errors, where an electron interacts with itself, which is, doesn't make any sense. But we need somehow to deal with these kind of problems. Uh, to explain you a little bit better what I, do I mean by self-interaction uh, error, let us consider the simplest possible system, which is the H2 plus molecule. So on the left, we see uh, this molecule and in green, the charge density distribution. So let us imagine that we are now pulling apart two uh, ions. So we increase the distance D between them. So what the question I'm asking, what happens to the electronic charge density? So if we use DFT, what we obtain is that the, end, uh, the, the charge density is distributed equally between uh, left ion and right ion. So we have 50% on the left and 50% on the right. Uh, but we know that if we show, solve the Schrodinger equation for this system, there are actually uh, many solutions to this. So what we show here is one solution, but there can be also others. Some, like for example, we have 100% of electron on the left and zero on the right, or vice versa, 100% on the right, zero on the left, or any linear combination of this is also a good solution, like 75% on the left and 25 on the right, etc. But DFT gives us just one solution, 50-50. Now, uh, the origin of the problem is, the, as I said, self-interaction error, or in other words, the quadraticity of the energy. So what happens is that when we are adding a fraction of an electron to the ion, energy changes quadratically, as you can see here. But in reality, it must be linear. And this quadratic behavior is unphysical and spurious, and this is due to the self-interaction errors. And because of this problem, if we try to use DFT with uh, simple approximations to exchange correlation functionals, we are obtaining unreliable results. So we need better methods that would allow us, us to somehow alleviate these self-interaction errors. If we now talk about the realistic material, in particular, uh, some, some casted material like olivine phase uh, at uh, fractional concentration of lithium, uh, 0 0.5. So we, we also observe exactly the same problem of self-interaction errors. So in reality, we have a mixed valence phase where we have iron in two oxidation states, like three plus and two plus. But if we use DFT with approximate functionals, we have something averaged out. So something like 2.5 plus, because this happens because the electron which is injected in the system with lithium plus ion is uh, delocalized and spread all over the, the cell. So the electron doesn't want to localize on one particular iron, but it really spreads out and equally distributes everywhere, which doesn't make any sense. It's, it's a, really an issue. And again, as I said before, this is linked directly to the energetics, uh, how energy behaves as a function of a uh, number of electrons in the manifold, uh, 3D manifold. So N is the number of electrons in a 3D manifold. And the exact and correct solution must be in green, the uh, piecewise linear. We see straight lines connecting the these integer values, but approximate DST gives us some like parabolic-like or quadratic-like behavior, which is wrong. So we need to solve this problem somehow to be able to model uh, battery materials. And one method, there are many methods, but in my talk, I'm going to focus on one of the methods, is the so-called DFT plus Hubbard. The main idea is highlighted in this uh, blue rectangle. So we have that the total energy of the system E is equal to the total energy obtained from approximate DFT, EDFT, 
plus some corrective terms. Sorry, corrective term. So this term is shown here. It's one half sum over atoms labeled I and spin sigma. Uh, U of I is the, the really critical parameter, which is called on-site Hubbard interaction parameter. And then we have trace of one minus N times N and N are uh, atomic occupation matrices that depend on atomic index spin and magnetic quantum numbers in one and two. And they have simple <clears throat> definition. We sum up over uh, states labeled I, Fi are Fermi direct distribution, Psi are Consham or if you want block wave functions and Phi are some atom centered orbitals. So this occupation matrix, atomic occupation matrix are useful because by taking a trace of this matrix, we can uh, essentially tell how many electrons are sitting on the 3D shell of, of iron, for example. So this correction is very simple, but it depends on some uh, external parameter U, which is in principle unknown. But I will talk in, uh, more about this uh, in a while. So thanks to this correction, what happens is that we are able now to localize electrons. So if you remember, I told before that in approximately if the electron wants to delocalize all over the simulation cell, with this simple corrective term, we are able to really localize electrons on, on irons, for example. And this is so because we are uh, going towards the piecewise linear behavior of the energy. So we are restoring the so-called piecewise linearity of the total energy. Uh, there is even more generalized or extended formulation of this correction. It's called extended uh, DFT plus Hubbard, where we have not only the on-site correction term, but we have also the inter-site uh, corrective term, which now depends on another parameter, which we call V, but this parameter uh, depends on two indices, I and J. So it's really the, the parameter that describes the strengths of the interaction between neighbors, let's say iron and neighboring oxygen. And now we are dealing also with generalized occupation matrices, which are called NIJ. So if the first corrective term wants to localize electrons, the second term does the opposite. It wants to delocalize it in order to restore the hybridization. So if we uh, think of some uh, materials with strong covalent interactions, we really need to use this generalized expression because uh, covalent interaction is physical and it should be there. Instead, if we use just the Hubbard U correction where we will kill the physical effect and the result will be uh, inaccurate. So this is uh, state of the art, DFT plus U plus V. Now, uh, as I mentioned before, in those corrective terms, we need to know somehow those parameters on site U and inter site V. They are not known a priori, so what people do, the simplest solution is simply try to tune them or calibrate uh, until you reproduce some experimental property of interest. For example, band gap or magnetic moment or lattice parameters or oxidation enthalpy, uh, you name it. However, this is not a uh, ab initio approach because you sort of tune it somehow, but it would be really nice to have some way to determine these parameters from first principles. So if I give you a system, you can simply compute those parameters without relying on experimental results because sometimes we don't have experimental results. So then we don't know how to determine Hubbard parameters, but if we can compute them, that's much more robust. So the idea is very simple. To determine these Hubbard parameters, we want to uh, remove this, this spurious curvature of the total energy. So with these arrows, I highlight the curvature and we want to get rid of it. So what we want, mathematically speaking, is that the second derivative of total energy is zero. And it was shown in the papers uh, shown on the uh, left bo uh, bottom of my slide. It was shown that from this condition, we can derive the precise and exact expressions how Hubbard parameters can be computed. And this is simply defined as the second derivative 
of the DFT total energy with respect to the occupations minus some non-interacting term. I don't want to go into the details. And recently, we reformulated it uh, in an efficient way in this two, uh, second and third reference uh, in terms of density functional perturbation theory. So now we have a, a method that allows us to compute Hubbard parameters for any system at hand. And this method was implemented in uh, open source quantum express package, which I mentioned in the next slides. So, and we are following certain protocol when we compute the Hubbard parameters. We call it self-consistent workflow of DFT plus Hubbard, and it is schematically represented here. So what we do is the following. We <clears throat> take some structure, for example, a geometrical one, oh, sorry, uh, from some database like COD or ICSD. We take some experimental geometry, then we uh, perform structural optimization. If you want, for example, at the level of DFT, if we don't know initial values of Hubbard parameters, then we perform a self-consistent field SCF ground state calculation. And then we compute Hubbard parameters using DFPT, the linear response theory that I mentioned before. And we repeat this cycle until uh, Hubbard parameters and the structure don't change. So it's actually it's a double loop where we are uh, optimizing the ionic positions and also we're optimizing electronic structure. So such that at the end of the day, we obtain uh, converged self-consistent Hubbard parameters, which are fully uh, consistent with the underlying geometry. Essentially, in other words, we are driving the system towards the global minimum. And as I mentioned before, this is uh, implemented in the open source uh, quantum espresso package, which is one of the most widely used codes in uh, electronic structure. And as you can see, it's really uh, very popular. You see that over the years, how many citations uh, that rely on this software. And second bit is the uh, AIDA software, which is developed here uh, in our group. Uh, it's a manager for high throughput simulations using in particular Quantum Espresso. So thanks to AIDA and Quantum Espresso, we are able to run hundreds or even thousands of calculations in uh, automatic way without human intervention. And in particular, now we're having a project where we're uh, studying uh, a few thousand of uh, lithium containing compounds to search for new promising cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. And uh, now let's switch for uh, two applications. Uh, let us start with phosphoalevene cathode material. So here on the right, I show uh, the, the cathode material at different stages during uh, lithiation and delithiation. So at the top, we have fully delithiated case. Uh, in the middle, 50% uh, of lithium, and at the bottom, fully lithiated case. And as you can see, I highlighted that the fully delithiated material has iron all in the 3 plus oxidation state. And at the bottom, iron is in the two plus oxidation state. However, intermediate structure has a mixed valence phase where we have both iron three plus and iron two plus. So let us look if we manage to describe this challenging case of mixed uh, iron two plus and three plus with standard DFT and also using DFT plus Hubbard. So this is uh, to give a bit more details how we simulate this. So this is the simulation cell for uh, the phosphoolivine. We have four formula units. In green, we show uh, lithium, oxygen in red, uh, phosphorus are in this tetrahedra, and we have uh, four octahedra, in the centers of which we have either iron or manganese or both. So we consider three cases, uh, just, just iron or just manganese or 50% manganese and 50% iron. And the material is antiferromagnetic. So with these arrows, we indicate uh, the um, orientation of spin. 
and it is insulating, is known experimentally. So before I say that we can use uh, DFT plus Hubbard and we can determine Hubbard parameters for uh, each transition metal ion. So I would like to highlight that during delithiation process, when we start removing lithium one by one, uh, some transition metals will change their oxidation state. And the Hubbard U parameter will be different for different transition metal elements, depending on the oxidation state. So let's see how, what do we obtain? So this is the table where I summarize uh, Hubbard parameters that we computed using our methods for the case of manganese. Uh, we consider here uh, five uh, concentrations of lithium. And here in these four columns, because we have four uh, manganese in the cell, I report the values of Hubbard parameters in electron volts. For example, we see that uh, when we don't have lithium, so e x equals to zero, all four manganese have exactly the same value of the Hubbard parameter, which is 6.26, because all manganese are in the same uh, oxidation state. But then when we fully lithiate material, x equals to one, the Hubbard parameter has changed, and now it is 4.56 for all manganese ions. And interestingly, in between these two uh, limiting cases, the Hubbard parameter also changes. For example, when we add one lithium, so we have x equal one fourth, only one manganese shows change in the, in the, in the Hubbard value. So the manganese four went from 626 to 544, while all others uh, remain more or less the same. They change slightly, but they remain more or less the same. When we're adding a second lithium, now the second manganese changed its Hubbard value, Hubbard U value, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, quite important to do this consistently because what is done in the literature nowadays is that people use empirical uh, Hubbard parameters, for example, by using uh, uh, by uh, fitting to the experimental oxidation enthalpies, and they use unique global value all across all concentrations of lithium. That's quite drastic approximation. Nonetheless, it gives quite quite good results. Not sure if always, but in some cases it gives. But what we do here, we really take into account more accurately what happens at the electronic level. We really re compute it site dependent. So how each manganese changes its electronic uh, state, its oxidation state, so Hubbard parameter changes. Now let us look at the uh, atomic populations. These are uh, loading uh, populations. So here I show uh, three panels. The top panel corresponds to the uh, atomic populations computed at the DFT, DFT level. Uh, the middle panel corresponds to the populations computed using another popular method, HSE06, which is the hybrid functional, which is computationally extremely expensive, but gives uh, much better results than DFT. And finally, the bottom panel will show uh, the populations computed our method DFT plus U plus V. And what we show on the y-axis is the uh, occupation of the 3D shell of manganese. And on the x-axis, uh, different lithium concentrations. And each bar represents one manganese uh, ion in the cell. We have four of them. So we see, for example, uh, that in DFT, the top panel, when we increase the concentration of lithium, the uh, occupations of all manganese change simultaneously. This is so because uh, the electron is delocalized and spread uh, equally uh, among all manganese atoms, which is wrong, of course. You see that on average, all manganese increase their occupancy little by little, which is not correct. Instead, the other two methods, which are uh, much more accurate, uh, they show, we call it the digital change in the occupations. We see that just one manganese at a time shows the jump in the occupation. So it changes the oxidation state from three plus to 
two plus, so one at a time. So we call it digital change. And this is consistent between DFT plus U plus V and uh, uh, more expensive method hybrid HSE 06. Uh, in the case of iron, if we do exactly the same analysis, we again observe that DFT fails because occupations change uh, on average equally, which is not correct. While hybrid HSE 06 uh, sort of tries to show the digital change in occupations, but it's not very accurate, as you can see. Uh, instead, DFT plus U plus V still works very well and very clearly shows digital change in the occupations. Finally, if we consider the, the mixed case, where we have 50% of manganese and 50% of iron, we see that from zero to one half, it's manganese who is uh, changing the oxidation state. And from one half to one, it's now uh, iron that changes its oxidation state. And again, we see that for manganese, we see digital change, while for iron, again, hybrid is not very accurate, while DFT plus U plus, U plus V is very accurate. Now let us uh, check voltages. We compute voltages using this simple uh, expression. We just need uh, to know the total energies of uh, materials. Uh, the first term is the total energy of, uh, of the material at the concentration of lithium X2. Uh, second term, the same, but at concentration of lithium X1. Then the total energy of uh, bulk lithium and uh, yeah, the difference between concentrations X2 and X1. So here we neglected uh, entropic and pressure uh, volume effects. It's usually done in the literature. And this is the, the results, which, we, which was, by the way, uh, recently, uh, is now is in press in PRX energy. So here we see that DFT systematically underestimates voltages, while hybrid HSE06 in blue uh, corrects it, but too much. Uh, DFT plus U, uh, similar to hybrids, it uh, gives too much of correction. And the best agreement with experiment is obtained really when we use DFT plus U plus V. Uh, so the error between experiment and, and our best DFT plus U plus V calculations is of the order of 0.1 volt, which is quite uh, remarkable. Uh, another interesting point that I would like to discuss is the redox potential shifts. Uh, this is uh, from the experimental paper uh, shown below. Uh, voltage uh, profile at different concentrations of lithium and different compounds. So in, 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 in the iron olivine, we have one plateau with the voltage of 3.5. 43 volt. In manganese wells, uh, there is only one plateau. But in the intermediate case, when we have 50% uh, of iron and 50% of manganese, we have two plateaus. So the first plateau corresponds, is similar to the voltage of, uh, of the pristine iron olivine. And the second plateau corresponds to the voltage, is similar to the voltage of the pristine manganese olivine. But as I, I would like to uh, underline that the voltages are, do not match exactly with the uh, pristine elements. And this can be shown from the figure on the right. So uh, what we see here in red is the manganese 2 plus 3 plus redox couple. And the voltage is not exactly the same. So we have 4.13 volt in the manganese olivine. However, when we replace half of manganese by iron, the voltage drops to 4.05. And if we do the same for iron, in the uh, pristine iron olivine, the voltage is 3.43 volt. And when we replace half of iron by manganese, it goes up to 3.49. This is known as redox potential shifts. Shift, sorry. And this was also reported in another experimental paper shown here. And we also observe the same redox potential shifts in our calculations. By absolute value, we are overestimating uh, these shifts. 
but qualitatively it is there. For example, we go from 4.20 to 4.04 in the case of manganese and from 3.53 to 3.72 in the case of iron. So why there is this uh, redox potential shift? In the literature, it was already, uh, there are several papers explaining why this is happening. And this is happening because there are changes in the metal oxygen bond length upon increase of manganese content in the mixed transition metal olivines. So in this table, I report uh, uh, the bond length. Uh, and on the figure on the right, we have uh, the, the, the octahedron. In the center of this octahedron, we have manganese. And we have uh, in yellow, uh, tetrahedra in the centers of which we have phosphorus. So we can distinguish different types of oxygens at the corners of the uh, purple octahedron. We have XL O1 and O2 oxygens, and we have uh, equatorial O3 oxygens and O3 prime. So what is interesting is that when we, uh, when we deletheate the material, so the, the total volume of, this, of, the, uh, of the cell decreases, but also the volume of octahedron decreases. So this can be seen also that there is a shrinkage of the bond length, all except uh, those which are related to O3 prime oxygens. So it's very interesting because the volume decreases and all bond length decreases except uh, two bond lengths which actually increase. And, and this is why this actually uh, so-called pseudo Yanteller effect, it is not the, the, the standard Yanteller effect because uh, here the, the symmetry is preserved, the symmetry, uh, the point group symmetry of the octahedron is preserved. But uh, strictly speaking, this is not the, the classical Jan Teller effect. So it's known in literature as pseudo Jan Teller effect. And this does not occur in the case of iron, by the way. And by the way, also this happens because these bonds, uh, manganese O3 prime, are connected to uh, the, the phosphorus tetrahedron via edge sharing. And it is known that phosphorus tetrahedra are very rigid. And that's why this affects uh, the behavior of the bonds, bond lengths uh, when we deliciate or lithiate the material. While the other two or three, they are not edge sharing, but they are corner sharing. And that's why they can, uh, they can uh, shrink. Uh, let us talk a little bit more about lithium vacancy ordering. So since we, we study different lithium concentrations, one has to pay attention to different possible configurations of lithium. Uh, so all cases except X equal to one half are quite unique. So there is one possibility, one configuration, but at X equals to one half, there are three possi possibilities of how we can arrange lithium. And they are shown here. So what we did, we computed the, the, the total energy of each of these configuration and, com and figured out which one of them has the lowest energy. And it turns out that uh, configuration one has the lowest uh, energy in all uh, three materials and uh, all three uh, methods except one, which is the, the iron olivine that in the case of hybrid functional, actually configuration two is the lowest in energy. But all the rest, we systematically find that configuration one is the lowest in energy. And then we computed the formation energies. So here, first let's consider the manganese olivine. On the, on the y axis, we show formation energy in milliv per formula unit, and x axis is the concentration of lithium. Uh, and the formation energy is computed using three methods. So DFT fails, not surprisingly, while the other two methods, DFT plus U plus V and hybrid, uh, they are in agreement with experiments because formation energies are positive. And this agrees with the experimental observation of the uh, two-phase uh, process. In the case of iron, 
uh, DFT fails because formation energies are negative and also IB functional fails, which is quite surprising. And only one method, DFT plus U plus V, uh, gives the correct result because the formation energies are positive because in experiments, again, there is a two-phase uh, process. And the most challenging case is this mixed manganese iron olivine. We, we, we need to consider uh, with more care each concentration. So when X equals one fourth, we obtain that a hybrid functional and DFT plus U plus V go give positive formation energy. And let's look uh, what is known from experiments. So this is the, the phase diagram from, from this uh, quite old publication. On the y-axis, we show uh, the fraction of manganese in the mixed olivine. And on the x-axis, we show the concentration of lithium. And as we can see, it's quite complex uh, phase diagram. We have different regions. But I would like to uh, that we focus on the B case, two-phase uh, process, and C, which is the single-phase process. So since we're considering uh the case of y equal to 0 0.5 so we draw this red horizontal line and we consider three concentrations which is 0 0.25 0 0.50 and 0 0.75 so we draw these three vertical uh, lines and we need to look at the cross of these lines so at the concentration of 0 0.25 we find that according to experiments it is a two-phase process, which means that the formation energy must be positive. And in fact, in our calculations, we obtain positive formation energies, which is very good. Next, at uh, 0 0.75, we find, we know that from experiments that it's a single-phase process. So the structure should be stable, which means formation energy must be negative. And if we look at our calculations, we find that the hybrid functionals give the correct behavior uh, and it's on the convex hull, while DFT plus U plus V unfortunately gives a result which is not consistent with experiments. The possible reason why DFT plus U plus V fails is that we neglected uh, configuration entropy terms in the simulation. So possibly if we include them, the trend might change, but we need to verify this. But so far, DFT plus U plus V failed while hybrid shows the right solution. And finally, at concentration one half, uh, from experiments, we can't really conclude what's happening because it's really the border line between two regions, two phase and single phase. So we can't con make any conclusions, but from our simulations, we find that both hybrid functional and DFT plus U plus V, they give very essentially the same result. And these are negative formation energies, uh, which suggests that uh, the the, it must be a single phase process. We also computed spin polarized projected density of states. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but very quickly, uh, we we show three columns, which are three methods, DFT, DFT plus U plus V and hybrid. And we show five rows corresponding to different concentrations of lithium. And this is the mixed, uh, mixed olivine where we have two irons and two manganese in the simulation cell. But what I would like to, to pass the take home message is that DFT plus U plus V and hybrid functional, they show very, very similar qualitative behavior. So how electronic states move as we lithiate the material. They show very similar trends. And this means that instead of using computationally very expensive hybrid functionals, we can use uh, less computationally expensive DFT plus U plus V. But we also saw before that voltages are uh, more accurate than with hybrids. So that's another reason why DFT plus U plus V seems to be a very uh, attractive method. We also consider other classes of materials such as spinel. So here I show two materials, lithium MN204, and the second case where we 
partially substitute manganese by nickel. So in the on the left case, uh, we have two types of manganese, manganese three plus and manganese four plus. When we remove fully lithium, uh, manganese three plus uh, reduces to manganese four plus. Sorry, yes, uh, it oxidizes to four plus. While on the right hand side, we have manganese four plus and nickel two plus. So when we remove lithium, manganese uh, stays manganese four plus, while nickel changes its oxidation state from two plus to four plus. This material, so the left material is uh, anti ferromagnetic, quite complex magnetic ordering, while the material on the right is ferrimagnetic because we have more manganese we spin up and then nickel we spin down. We computed voltages for these two materials and of, we again obtain similar trends that DFT um, underestimates largely the voltages, DFT plus U over corrects and DFT plus U plus V again gives the, the closest agreement with experiments. Though now the error is a bit larger, is around 0.2 volt while for olivines we had 0.1 volt. But it would be interesting also to study other classes of materials like layered uh, and nasicon and others. Uh, so far I was talking about lithium ion batteries, but of course uh, we can replace lithium with sodium and uh, other elements. Uh, in particular, I would like to mention about sodium ion batteries. They are very attractive. As we all know, I think there is no need really to go through these points here. I just would like to mention that uh, together with uh, Manuel, we have started a collaboration uh, to try and use the FT plus U plus V uh, to study some Nasican materials. In particular, we are interested in this uh, iron containing uh, Nasican material, but also we probably will have a look at other uh, cases where instead of iron, we put other transition metal elements, or probably we have a mixture of, of, of those. So we are very excited to see whether DFT plus U plus V is reliable. And, and of course, uh, if we can find a, a good agreement with experiments for very, various properties like voltages, but also many others. And with this, uh, I think I can conclude my talk. I hope uh, I convinced you the DFT plus U plus V is a robust and accurate first principles method for modeling lithium ion, but also other types of uh, battery materials. Uh, I would like to remind one more time that often in the literature, people use Hub, uh, empirical Hubbard parameters, while we have developed methods that allows us to compute Hubbard parameters for any material and describe very accurately uh, local changes in the local chemistry during the operation of the battery, such as lithiation, delithiation, and also on the examples of phosphoolivines and spinel cathode materials, uh, we have seen that such properties as structural, actually I didn't discuss structural, but electronic and electrochemical are quite well described and in, and in good agreement with experiments. And finally, I would like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators, uh, Professor Nicola Marzari from EPFL, uh, Francesco Aquilante, Michel Cotuga, and Matteo Cococcioni, and our uh, sponsors, Marvel, Swiss National Science Foundation. And of course, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>